Hello. Uh, so what are, today we'll talk about measuring exposure to exchange rate fluctuations and that is chapter 10 of the textbook. So what are some of the things we want to talk about? Uh, discuss, we'll talk about the relevance of an MNC's exposure to exchange rate fluctuations. So why that is important? Why should we care about our exposure to exchange rate risk? We will talk about how transaction exposure can be measured. So, you know, if you look at a company such as Microsoft, they do business all over the world, which means that they get paid in different currencies. So how can we figure out our net exposure? And we'll also talk about how economic exposure can be measured. So we'll talk about what is meant by economic exposure and how we can measure it and how translation exposure can be measured. So why do we care about this? That I think is the first question. And if you look at this, uh, there are several arguments. The first one is the investor hedge argument. So basically what we typically assume is that investors are uh, holding portfolios and by holding diversified portfolios they are you know pretty much automatically hedged against uh, risk so given that perhaps the firm should not be hedging that is the investor hedging argument the second one is the currency diversification argument so if US based MNC is well diversified across numerous currencies its value will not be affected by exchange rate risk and I'm not sure how valid that this argument is and the main reason being that even if you look at a firm such as Microsoft or Apple and so on you know they might be primarily exposed to maybe three or four currencies such as the euro maybe the peso, the Chinese yuan, and so on, which basically means that they are really not well diversified. And the last one is the stakeholder diversification argument, which basically states that if stakeholders are well diversified, they will be somewhat insulated against losses due to MNC exchange rate risk. So in this case, we are talking about the employees, perhaps the top management, we are talking about customers, and we are talking about suppliers. And I think the main reason why firms hedge is because some of the top managers, so people who have significant amounts of their wealth invested within the firm, they might not be holding well-diversified portfolios. So as an example, if you look at Bill Gates, he is you know, one of the richest people in the world, and most of his wealth is tied up to Microsoft. So which basically tells you that he does not hold a well diversified portfolio. If you look at the CEO of Apple, again, you know, he has a substantial part of his wealth invested within the company. Now the same thing might happen to the CEO of Facebook or the CEO of LinkedIn and so on. So all of these people started these companies and most of their wealth is tied up with the company. So that's one of the reasons why uh, it might be in their incentives to hedge their exposure. And you know, remember, these are also the people who are in control. These are the people who call the shots. So what are the forms of trans, uh, exposure, exchange rate exposure? The first one is the transaction exposure. So what does it tell you? Basically, we are looking at the different transactions undertaken by the firm and how they are exposed to that. The second one is economic exposure. And the last one is translation exposure. So here, I think chapter 11, we talk about transaction exposure. And chapter 12 deals with economic and translation exposure. So let's talk about transaction exposure right now. And I think if you look at this formula, okay, so if you look at what we see here, uh, basically what we find here is that uh, I think some of you might have taken courses in investments and I think you remember you must have talked about finding out the risk and return of a two stock portfolio and if you look at the formula we have here that is very similar so the formula we're going to use here talks about how you can figure out the sensitivity of the firm's contractual transactions in foreign currencies to exchange rate moments. So basically here, it's like figuring out the risk and uh, risk of a two stock portfolio or the risk of a two investment portfolio. So what we have here, the formula is given by sigma p. Uh, basically sigma p is So sigma p stands for okay 
So Sigma P stands for the standard deviation of the portfolio. And what we are saying here is that the Sigma P is given by the the weight in the first investment, so the weight in the first currency, so that basically tells you the fraction of your investment in the first currency, the weight in the second currency, and then what we have is sigma x and sigma y. So sigma x stands for the standard deviation of the first currency, sigma y stands for the standard deviation of the second currency, and cor x stands for the correlation between the two currencies. So here the portfolio standard deviation is given by wx squared sigma x squared. So that is the weight in the first currency times the standard deviation of the first currency. wy sigma y. So weight in the second currency times the standard deviation of the second currency plus two times weight in the first currency. The weight in the second currency, the standard deviation of the first currency, the standard deviation of the second currency and how they move together. So correlation of x and y stands for the correlation between the two currencies. So if you go back to perhaps the statistics course you took or perhaps the finance course you took, cor xy stands for the correlation between the two investments and here that is a number between minus one and plus one. So minus one means that the two currencies move exactly in opposite directions. Uh, cor, uh, plus one means that they move exactly together and when it is zero it means that they have nothing to do with each other. So what are some of the factors that come in the formula? The first one is measurement of currency variability. So here we have to figure out the standard deviation of currency X, the standard deviation of currency Y, that is the measurement of currency variability. Uh, we want to measure the currency variability over time. We want to look at the currency correlation. So here cor or rho stands for the correlation with the two currencies and applying the currency correlations to net cash flows and finally we also need the currency correlations over time. Now, why do we care about this? So this graph basically shows uh, you, a company has to make a payment, let's say of 1 million euros every quarter. So the first time it made the payment, that was in first quarter 2006, the exchange rate was 1.2. So the payment it had to make was 1.2 million. Now in third quarter 2007, the payment is uh, 1.4 because the exchange rate is 1.4, it goes to you know 1.6 almost in 2008 and so on. So what we find is that the payment in euros is the same but because of changes in the exchange rate, the actual dollar amount that has to be paid moves substantially over time. Okay? Now let's look at assessing transaction exposure. So let's look at a simple case. Your employer, a large MNC, has asked you to assess the transaction exposure. Its projected cash flows are uh, for the following, are as follows for the following next year. So what we find here is that the cash flows are 5, 50 million is the inflow, 40 million is the outflow and the exchange rate is 0.5. So how do you figure out the net change? Uh, the net inflow is going to be 50 minus 40 which is the 10 million. Okay. And if you look at the British pound, the inflow is 2 million, the outflow is 1 million, and the net inflow is going to be 1 million. So these are the amounts that a firm gets. And uh, if you look at the exchange rate, the exchange rate is 0.15 for the first currency. So the net inflow is 1.5 million. And for the British pound, uh, the net inflow is 1 million pounds and an exchange rate of 1.5 the value of exposure is 1.5 million US dollars. So what we find here is that in this case these two currencies are moving in the same direction. So given that both of them are inflow, inflows and given that both of them move in the same direction, what we find is that the company's exposure would actually be magnified. It gets increased because both the currencies are in the same direction and both of them are inflows. Now we want to talk about transaction exposure based on value at risk. So basically here what we want to do here is that we want to talk about what is meant by value at risk. So value at risk is an important concept in finance and what does it do? Basically what the definition is that it gives you 
the maximum loss you can have. So basically we can talk about the maximum percentage loss or the maximum dollar loss. And basically what we see here is that uh, uh, what are some of the factors? Some of the factors that affect are uh, the change in the currency and the confidence level used as well as the standard deviation. So how do we find this out? Basically what we are saying is that is given by the expected change, okay, expected change minus the confidence interval times the standard deviation. So this is what we use to find out the value at risk. So basically here the expected change in the currency, the confidence level and the standard deviation of the uh, changes in the currency. Uh, so why do we care about this? So some of the reasons why we care about this is because if you are let's say a company like Microsoft, you are exposed to different types of risk. So for Microsoft, some of the risks they are exposed to would be their exposure to the stock market, mainly because you know they are trading the stock market. They also have investments in other companies. They are exposed to different currencies. So some of the ex uh, currencies would be the Euro, uh, the Japanese Yen, the Peso and so on. And they also have some exposure to commodity prices. And the reason is that although they are primarily a software company, they also invest, uh, uh, you know, make the Xbox and now they make the Surface Pro and so on. So in both these cases, they have, they are exposed to some commodity prices. So here for a company such as Microsoft, they are a publicly traded company, they are liable to their shareholders. So they basically want to convey to the shareholders that we know what is our risk exposure and we are able to manage that. And how do they do that? One way that companies do that is in their financial statements, they talk about their risk exposure. Okay? And usually when you talk about risk exposure, how you measure it is due to using the value at risk method. Okay? So we want to apply, we can also apply the VAR to longer time horizons. We can apply the value at risk to transaction exposure of portfolio. And we can also have, you know, there are, uh, apps and there are uh, add-ons to Excel that we can use to figure out the value at risk. So these are some of the applications or uh, how you can use the value at risk. So you know rather than use a one day we can use a one week, you can use a one month, you can use a one year and so on and we can apply the value at risk transaction exposure of a portfolio. So one of the places where I think this is very popular is in the hedge fund industry because you know they are you know exposing themselves to different types of risk and given that they want to figure out what is their net exposure so you can find if you go online classes on this you have one day seminars and so on on how to use and apply the value at risk and you know if you go online you can also find out add-ons to excel which which you can use to figure out the value at risk now what are some of the limitations of the value at risk presumes that the distribution of the exchange rate movements is normal. So that is, you know, the limitations of most of the uh, models we see in finance. Basically, what we have there is that all of them assume that things are normally distributed. And reality is that things may not be normally distributed. And the second is that assumes that the volatility of exchange rate movements is stable over time. So again here, what we are assuming is that the standard deviation is constant and that may not be exactly true. Okay. So let's see what we can do here. So what we have here is that we have the prices of exchange rate for the Swiss franc and we have the Argentine peso. So what we see here is that these are monthly prices and in the first month the exchange rate is 0.6, in the second month it's 0.64, so the change is going to be 0.64 minus 0 0.60 divided by 0 0.60, so that gives you the 6.67 percent, okay? So that is what we are doing here to calculate the change in the exchange rate on a daily basis. The second time uh, it was initially in year month 2 it was 0 0.64, in month 3 it's 0 0.6. So in that case it's going to be a decline of 6.25 percent and so on. We can do the same thing for uh, the Argentine peso. So what we have here is that we have a column with 
the changes in the Swiss franc and we have a column with the changes in the Argentine peso. So for this column, the first column, uh, we can figure out the standard deviation of the Swiss franc. That would be 5.57. So in Excel, you have the standard deviation routine. You can use that to figure out the standard deviation of that column. Similarly, the standard deviation of the second column. And the last one, what we have is we have a portfolio. We are investing money 50-50. Half the money is in Swiss francs and half the money is in Argent peso. And we are figuring out the uh, return of the portfolio on a monthly basis and the standard deviation of the portfolio. So what we have here is that we have pretty much what we want uh, to figure out the value uh, at risk. So what we need is we need the weights uh, to find out the standard deviation and we did that. We have the standard deviation of each currency. We also have the standard deviation of the portfolio. So given that, we can figure out, let's say, the one month loss and so on. So the one month loss would be the expected change minus the standard deviation times the confidence interval. Okay. So let's look at one example. You use today's spot rate of the Brazilian real to forecast the spot rate of the real for one month ahead. Today's spot rate is 0.4558 and use the value at risk method to determine the maximum percentage loss of the Brazilian real over the next month based on a 95% confidence level and use the spot rates at the end of each of the last six months to conduct your analysis. So basically here we have the end of month values and based upon that we can find out the standard deviation. So the standard deviation here is 4.09 and once we have that, what we said was that would be the expected change, okay? Minus the confidence interval times the standard deviation. So uh, what they wanted to do is find out the maximum loss, okay? So the maximum loss would be the expected change, which is, uh, we are assuming it's zero, minus 1.65 okay, uh, times the standard deviation. Standard deviation here is uh, 4.09. And if you want to look at the, do, uh, the change in terms of dollar change, that would be the current exchange rate, which is 0 0.4548 times 1 minus 0 0.0675. So that gives you 0.4250. Okay. So that would be the change in the exchange rate. So I think there are two things you want to remember. The first is what is the 95% confidence interval? What is the value? That is 1.65. And the second one is at the 97.5% confidence interval, what is the value? That would be 1.96. So let's talk about economic exposure. So here, the sensitivity of the firm's cash flows to exchange rate movements, sometimes referred to as operating exposure. So basically what we are saying here is that how does the cash flows of our business depend upon let's say the euro to US dollar exchange rate or the Japanese yen to US dollar or the Chinese yuan to the US dollar. So how do we, how does economic exposure arise? It basically can arise from exposure to local currency appreciation, exposure to local currency depreciation. Now, before we talk about all that, I think one thing that is perhaps very important is that you can face economic exposure. You face economic exposure, okay, even if your company has no overseas operation. So that is perhaps a very important thing that you want to remember. So you might be a business that has nothing, no business overseas. So you might not be importing stuff from outside or you might not be exporting stuff to other countries. But even then, there could be a chance that you face economic exposure. Now, why is that? The main reason why you might face economic exposure is because you might still be facing 
competition from overseas companies. So basically here, let's say you're a manufacturer of uh, mats for rubber mats for cars. So basically, you know, you might not be exporting, you basically supply to the US uh, companies such as Chevy, Ford, uh, you know, and Chrysler. So even then, even if you buy all your stuff in the US and sell all your products in the US, you might still face economic exposure. The reason being that some of your competition can be in overseas. Okay. Now, what is economic exposure arises from local currency appreciation and local currency depreciation. Okay. So let's look at how you can measure economic exposure. So one of the ways is you can do a regression analysis. What we have here is that the percentage change in the cash flow for your company is given by A0 plus A1 times ET plus mu T. And here ET is the percentage change in the direct exchange rate. So for example, we are talking about how our cash flows are affected by changes in the UN. The ET would be the change in the US dollar to the Chinese UN. Now mu T is an error term. Okay. Mu T is an error term and basically it always becomes zero. Okay. So essentially what we are saying here is that you face economic exposure when the slope coefficient. So when A1 is different from zero and A1 is statistically significant, we say that we face economic exposure. So let's look at some examples. Local sales related to foreign competition in local markets. So impact of local currency appreciation on transactions. So what we are saying here is that if the US dollar appreciates with reference to the Chinese Yuan, chances are perhaps some of your customers might import more from China, which means that it's going to decrease your sales and perhaps your cash flows. Impact of local currency depreciation on transactions, that would be the opposite. Your cash flows would increase. Uh, firms export denominated in foreign currency. So if you're exporting stuff to other countries and if the US dollar increases in value, your sales will decrease. On the other hand, if the US dollar decreases, it's going to help you. Now transactions that influence the firm's local currency outflows. Firms imported supplies denominated in local currency. So basically you're importing stuff but you're paying in US dollars. It should have no change and impact of local currency depreciation again should have no change. Uh, interest on, on foreign currency borrowed. So let's say you should bonds in Europe and the US dollar strengthens, that's actually going to help you. And what happens if uh, local currency depreciates, if the US dollar depreciates against the Euro, it means that you will have to pay more for the interest that you have to pay. Okay. The last one is translation exposure. So basically what we are saying here is that it talks about the exposure of the MNC's consolidated financial statements to exchange rate fluctuation. So we are talking about the financial statements of the company and how that is affected by the exchange rate changes. So the first one is does translation exposure matter from a cash flow perspective? So in the case of a cash flow perspective, even if the exchange rate changes, it may not have any effect from a cash flow perspective. And the reason being that we have a cash flow only when the transaction actually takes place. So you, Apple has $50 billion lying outside the US. Now clearly they, the $50 billion, the value may change with the changes in the exchange rate. But here the cash flow will take place only if the money is actually bought into the country. So that is why from a cash flow perspective, it's not very clear. So only if the cash flow transaction take place would there be a change. Uh, what about the stock price perspective? So from a stock price perspective, it can be affected. Why is it that it can be affected? So the main reason why it can be affected is because in this case, you know, the money made outside, you have to bring it back into US, you want to convert it into US dollars and there when you talk about the earnings and so on. So earnings can be affected by the exchange rate which in turn can affect the stock price. So basically, you know, if we are using a, a ratio such as the P ratio, we are talking about the price per share divided by the earnings per share, which means that a change in the earnings can affect the price of the stock. 
Now, what are some of the de determinants of translation exposure? The first one is the proportion of business conducted by foreign subsidiaries. So how much of your business is from abroad? So if you look at a company such as Procter & Gamble, they do a lot of business in Europe, they do a lot of business in South America and so on. So given that, uh, the proportions will matter. And clearly, you know, for Procter & Gamble, they do a lot more business in Europe when compared to South America, at least in dollar terms. The location of foreign subsidiaries, so what are the countries? So for example, whether it's in Brazil, Brazil is a volatile currency, whether it's in Mexico, Mexico is a volatile currency, and Canada, Canada typically it's a less volatile currency. And the last one is the accounting methods used. So what we have here is, we have a company that does business in Canada, and the US sales are 320, the Canadian sales are uh, 3 million. So basically they have 4 million dollars of sales in Canada. We are assuming that the exchange rate is 0.75. So the Canadian sales is 3 million and the total sales is 323. So when we, when we look at the sales, most of the sales is in the US. The Canadian sales is far less. And if you look at the cost of materials, the cost of materials is in US they buy 50 million and Canada they are buying 200 million Canadian dollars or 150 million in US dollars. So the total cost of materials is 200. So what that tells you is that the bulk of their uh, raw materials is coming from Canada. So when you look at their sales, revenues are mostly in the US while the cost of goods sold, the expenses are mostly in Canada. And the total cost of materials is 200 and their operating expenses 60 million. Now, if you look at the interest expense, they have 3 million interest paid in the US and 7.5 paid in Canada. So total interest expense is 1050 and the cash flow is 5250. So what we find is that for this company, the bulk of their sales revenue is from US while the bulk of their cost is in Canada. Interest expense is not very high, but overall the cash flow is 5250. Now what happens when the exchange rate goes to 0.8? So when the exchange rate goes to 0.8, the US sales remains the same. The Canadian sales goes up a little bit to 320 because 4 million times 0.8 is 3.2. The cost of materials in the US is the same, no change. The cost of materials in Canada increases from 150 to 160. So the total cost of materials is 210. And when you look at the cash flows, it changes to 4220. So I think the big thing you see here is that when the exchange rate changes by 5 cents, so 5 cents is 0 0.05 over 75, okay? So that is 1 by 15 or 6 person. So when the exchange rate changes by 6.6 person, we find that the cash flows of this company change by almost 25 person. So here, the cash flows are affected substantially by a small change in the exchange rate. And when the exchange rate changes from 0.8 to 0.85, again, uh, what we find is that the cash flows in US dollars becomes 3190. So what we find here is that when the exchange rate changes by 10 cents from 75 to 85, the cash flows become almost half. It goes from 50 to 50 to 3190. Now, why does this happen for this company? I think the primary reason why this happens is because when you talk about the currencies, there is a mismatch. So most of their revenues are in the US, but most of the cost of goods sold are in Canada. So I think what should be the strategy of this company, that's something we'll talk about in chapter uh, uh, 12. Now, I think we just want to summarize what are some of the things we talked about with this chapter. So, what are some of the things we talked about with this chapter? I think the main things we talked about are, we talked about how you can figure out or how you can measure the transaction exposure. And that is the first thing we did. And how did we do that? The way we did that by, by using this formula, it tells you that the standard deviation of a portfolio is given by uh, w x squared sigma x squared plus w y squared sigma y squared uh, two times w x w y sigma x sigma sigma y times the correlation. So basically here, this formula is similar to figuring out the standard deviation of a 
to stock portfolio and this gives you the standard deviation of the portfolio. The second thing we talked about was we talked about the value at risk and what is the value at risk? So the value at risk is given by the expected change minus the confidence interval times the standard deviation. So there that tells you what is the most you can lose and we can talk about the maximum loss in terms of one day, in one week, one month and so on. So the nice thing is that you know that gives us some measure of the maximum loss and we also talked about some of the limitations and some of the limitations are we assume that the exchange rate movements are normally distributed that may not be true we also assume that the volatility of the exchange rate movements is stable over time so both of these may not be true and that is you know one of the limitations of uh, the pretty much you know all the analysis we do in finance as well as economics.